Every year, particularly at this time, Sir Matt Busby bears a very personal grief, a grief that paradoxically touches the lives of many people. Sir Matt is 78 years old. For 30 of those years, he has carried the scars, both mental and physical, of a tragic air crash that claimed 23 lives, eight of them players of his beloved Busby Babes, a disaster in which he nearly lost his own life, a disaster that shattered his dream. It's a very sad time. It's a very sad time for me uh, because uh, it's a situation and a position and a, a way that uh, I will never, never forget. I think the whole, the old uh, scene of the tragedy is a bad memory all throughout because it concerns quite a number of people and a lot of people who I had a great respect for and regard for. No way do I think that uh, Munich and Manchester United as a club will ever be separated because I don't believe that the Munich tragedy made Manchester United as a club. They were on the point of becoming the world's finest club side when it happened. When the year, uh, the turn of the year comes, uh, I, <coughs> the first thing is start saying, all right, well, we're getting towards the 6th of February and the, you go through all the things that happened. Uh, the terrible, tragic time we had, and the club, and, and the people concerned. We lost their lives, the parents of these people, journalists, staff, and everyone else. And no matter how long it is, it, one would say, all right, probably the first few years, it affects you more, and you're, you're more aware of it. In the, uh, Time doesn't heal these things, Paul. It doesn't heal them for me, anyway. I think, and maybe I, I'm not trying to be clever when I say it, I think he was fortunate in the fact that at the time and around the time, for quite some time, he was in no position to realise what had actually ha happened. And I think, I believe that uh, that maybe saved uh, a lot of suffering. Well, it was shock. It was utter shock. You know, and uh, I was so close to Matt, you see. Matt and I played against each other and in the army together and played for the army together. And uh, he captained Scotland, I captained England. So we were very, very close. And of course, then it was the Busby Babes. And uh, I coached the England schoolboys and Duncan Edwards. And there was David Pegg, Mark Jones. They were all in the side. So I, I, I knew the boys. Let's look what England had got to look forward to. We were preparing for the World Cup in 1958. And Roger, who had moved from a, a, a forward to a full back, was one of the top players in Europe. Duncan Edwards was, was the outstanding player, the outstanding player. And I'm rather uh, sad that youngsters have never seen Duncan play. They always say what a player he was, but they've never seen him. And then Tommy Taylor. He was just coming. And those were three players that were in the squad for England preparing for the World Cup in 1958 in Sweden. To lose this and have to start afresh and to go into a World Cup within three months of the disaster virtually, what it amounted to for the last match, we had two established players left. That's Billy Wright and Johnny Haynes. Tommy Finney had been injured. Clayton was out. And we had the rest of them were people who had played one international match 
Two of them in the last match hadn't played international match at all. They're being capped in it. That's no way to go into a World Cup. So you can see the Manchester United disaster really destroyed my dream. It was a tragedy not only to England uh, for Man United, but the whole of the world, a tragedy loss of great players. Well, this is a part of my history as a newspaper man. I always loved coming here because it was such a great side. And I think they set a milestone in English football. They were innovators. They were the first team to come into Europe. And now we're all aware of how European football is, is shaping. But these boys had to go in completely new, and they made a magnificent job. First year, they get to the semi-finals. They were not only a great team, they were an entertaining side. Free kick to United, taken by Byrne. Headed out to the far side. Very cleverly held by Benny, beats his man. It goes to Edwards, which is a good thing for United. A long one from Edwards down the right wing. Taylor's there. Taylor cuts inside. Flex it forward. still has it. And Taylor turns it back to Benny. Shoots! And it's a goal! There it is! They've got a fellow like Duncan Edwards. And people say to me, how good was Duncan Edwards? And I'm bound to say, and I was a great admirer of Bobby Moore, that if Duncan Edwards had lived, I don't think Bobby would have been a cap. Why not? Duncan Edwards played 16, 18 times for England, scored uh, six goals from left half. A goal every three matches. We've sent the forwards that can't score at that rate now. Behind him, you had Roger Byrne. Roger Byrne was a magnificent left back, again an innovator. If you think of Ray Wilson in the 66 side, well, he followed on a style that uh, Roger Byrne had perfected. And when you looked at the, at the right half position, little Eddie Coleman, he was a throwback to the old attacking wing half. He was a combination between an inside forward and a wing half. Beautifully balanced, small, a magnificent tackler. United leading by two goals to nil. Big, a long one out to the far side, heads go up there. Still bouncing at the goal mouth, it's hooked away out of this side, Peg racing onto it, turns it right across the far side again, ahead of there by Corbin in the penalty area, first time shot by Taylor, it's blocked. And, and then you look at the, the forward line, Tommy Taylor, leave outside Lawton, and uh, you have Lofthouse and Tommy Taylor, and probably Tommy would just have the edge on, on, on Nat even as a header of the ball. A fellow like uh, Bobby Charlton, he couldn't get in the side, he, he, he wasn't a regular in the side. You had Liam Whelan on the ball, a magnificent player on the ball. You'd got Johnny Berry on the, on the right wing. The only reason he, did, he never played regularly for England was there were two men by the name of Finney and Matthews. And outside left, David Pegg was, I think, just on the verge of becoming England's regular outside left. Mark Jones. You see, Mark Jones was a schoolboy international centre-half, and he was the kind of player that you would, you would have to knock him down to, to get past him. And at the same time, you see, Matt Busby also had Jack Blanchflower. We all call him the best football in centre-half in all the four countries. Jeff Bent. You see, Jeff Bent was really understudy for Roger Byrne, but he would have walked into any other side. He was a marvellously skillful player. And it was just one of the points of uh, the Busby Babes, as we called him in those days, that they had so many players to pick from. United had been quick to take the lead. This was through a goal by Dennis Violet, one of those injured in the crash. In the first half, the British team were making rings round the Yugoslavs, and they scored their second thanks to Bobby Charlton, another of the injured. This is how all would like to remember the boys of this great team playing typically fine football. Everybody was quite happy, you know, that, that OK, it was very, uh, very bad weather, but all we wanted to do was to get home and uh, tell our wives and families about what a great game we'd seen and happy to be back and bring in our presents. And just as we left the terminal buildings, you know, just the odd thought crossed my mind because I was in the Air Force, you know, I wonder whether, you know, I wonder whether there's been any ice on the wings and how they sorted it out. But it wasn't a thing that dwelt on my mind. It had uh, started to snow a little. When we came back out for our first uh, attempt at takeoff, then was we were leaving footprints in the snow on the first attempt, or before the first attempt, as we climbed back onto the aeroplane again. And uh, 
It gradually got a little worse as we tried each time and got out of the plane. What, after the second attempt, it had got quite a bit worse. There was this very striking red building which was quite clear. And as we came abreast of that, uh, suddenly the, the skipper just put the brakes on and the, the props were just whirring round and, hello, what's gone wrong? Well, we made uh, two attempts before the fatal run and on both of these occasions we had this boost surging which was not terribly serious but it was something that one ought to really do something about and I abandoned the first takeoff and got permission to turn around on the runway and make another attempt and this fort uh, came out again and at that stage I decided to go back to the tarmac to discuss it with the engineer. We set off out to the plane uh, I had a, a, a Rolleiflex camera with me and, and nipped in front of the queue uh, to take a picture of the uh, boys boarding the plane. Um, Duncan Edwards uh, quipped to remark, uh, another scoop. And I thought, well, it's just another delay if it's uh, just another picture of United delayed. When we boarded the aircraft in Belgrade, I found all my press colleagues had already settled themselves in the tail. Frank Swift was on this side, Henry Rose, George Follows on that side, I believe. And you see, we always flew together. We were always a happy party. But for some reason that day, I thought I'd move forward. And that was a decision that saved my life. 